without uh, further commentary, I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, C. Noel Barry Mers. Um, Dr. Barry Mers uh, holds the Women's Guild Chair in Women's Health and is director of the Barbara Streisand Women's Health Center, as well as the Preventative and Rehabilitation Cardiac Center at Cedars-Sinai uh, Heart Institute. She is a professor of medicine at Cedars-Sinai. Um, her research interests uh, include uh, women and heart disease, mental stress, uh, the role of exercise and stress management in reversing disease, and the role of nutrition in heart disease. She is the chair of the National Institute of Health sponsored WISE study, which is Women's Ischemic Syndrome Evaluation Initiative. She's currently uh, involved in that uh, uh, study and the investigation potential methods for more effective diagnosis and evaluation of coronary artery disease in women. We all, again, this is the practical side of things. We all know that women are uh, certainly different in their presentation with uh, heart disease and uh, trying to have some directive and, and guidance as to how to effectively evaluate them is uh, something we consider to be extremely important and this is uh, one area that Dr. Mers is going to help educate us about. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and then went on, went on to get her uh, medical degree from Harvard. Uh, she spent time in uh, our Northern California area uh, as a resident in medicine at the University of California in San Francisco uh, and then she went on to do the remainder of her post uh, doctoral training at uh, Cedar sinai and uh, there she remains. So it is my great pleasure uh, to in introduce Dr. Noel Barry Mers. It's always lovely to be back in Northern California. I'm actually um, a Valley girl, and when I say that in, in Los Angeles, they're like, well, you don't have that San Fernando Valley accent. And I say, no, I grew up in the Central Valley, the real Valley in Northern California. <clears throat> And of course, I have my seasonal allergies. So I was asked to talk about women in heart disease and what would you want and need to know um, for your practices, hopefully going back on Monday uh, with something useful. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, none of these represent a conflict. But as you know, uh, we all always disclose now. So here's a case. We'll start with a case, and we'll do just a few show of hands. And then we'll revisit these questions at the end. So 40-year-old female, status post-hospitalization for acute shortness of breath and chest tightness. Her ECG showed ST segment elevations, and she had an elevated troponin of 0.48. That is above our normal, uh, so that's a positive troponin. CT scan showed no evidence of pulmonary emboli, and a CCTA, the computed CAT scan angiography now, non-invasive, showed no obstructive CAD. So the patient was discharged from the hospital without a specific diagnosis. So five years ago, she was diagnosed with a positive ANA. It appeared to be borderline. She was later tested by her primary and diagnosed with systemic lupus with a more positive ANA. So she is para 2, grava 2. She had hypertension postpartum with both of these sons. Um, ECG now, in our office, she has non-ST T-wave changes. Um, her echo shows normal wall motion, normal ejection fraction. And here's her current medications, um, mostly not cardiac, uh, but if you uh, dry, dig down, um, she is on Plaquenil now for her lupus. Um, she's on Pravacol, 40 milligrams. She's taking a baby aspirin, and the doc put her on Verapamil, 120 milligrams, possibly for hypertension, possibly because maybe they thought she should be on some cardiac drug. Okay, so here's our questions, and we'll just go by a show of hand. What is the diagnosis? How many think that this is non-cardiac, that episode? Okay, well, there's one. How about pericarditis, uh, lupus patients, pericarditis? And then how about ischemic heart disease, um, status post ACSMI? Okay, so those that believe in the high sensitivity troponins. Um, should she have any further evaluations? How about nothing further is needed? How about exercise stress ECG testing? Yeah. And how about stress testing with imaging? Okay, good, all right. <clears throat> and then how should she be treated? 
How many think her current treatment is fine? Again, from a cardiac standpoint and from possible pericarditis or nothing else is needed. Current treatment is fine. How about indocin and steroids for a lupus pericarditis? Yeah. And then how about hold or replace her calcium channel blocker with a beta blocker, add an ACE and ARB, and intensify her statin? More hands. All right, we'll revisit these. So in 1991, these two women made history. Um, the gal on the left uh, is Dr. Bernadine Healy, the first female president of the National Institutes of Health, a, a cardiologist, um, the woman who got the Women's Health Initiated uh, started, uh, who started the National Institutes of Genomic Medicine and started the National Institutes of Nursing Research. Um, so uh, uh, very noteworthy. Uh, the woman on the right, uh, you know, uh, is a movie star, a director, a producer, our benefactor at our Cedar sinai Women's Heart Center, now named in her honor because of an endowment. Uh, and she is dressed up like a man, and so she is in her movie, in this picture, uh, The Yentl. And if you recall, The Yentl movie, which came out around this time, was the story of a, a female, a protagonist, in Eastern Europe, at that time, uh, the only way you could become literate, learn how to read and write, uh, and, and be a scholarly person was you had to be a man. So Yentl impersonated a man uh, to do that. Uh, Bernadine Healy wrote in the New England Journal right around this time uh, that she wondered if what was going on in cardiovascular disease was a Yentl syndrome. Uh, and she opined in the New England Journal that uh, perhaps we were seeing more heart attack deaths in women, more in women than men, which is still true, uh, because women were not being recognized uh, because they were women. They didn't look like men, and so they weren't being treated and recognized similar to the Yentl movie. So here's the data that was really the foundation for what Dr. Healy was writing about. Um, and what you can see, these are um, cardiovascular death mortality for our, our country, US of A. In 1984, women became the new female majority. Uh, certainly when I went to medical school and throughout my training, we were, we were taught it was predominantly a man's disease. Um, in the 1990s, um, the Yentl movie, and then Dr. Healy wrote her editorial in the New England Journal. Um, and uh, it took a full 12 years for our women's ischemia syndrome evaluation to be initiated, for this epidemic to be recognized, uh, and for National Heart, Lung, and Blood and the American Heart Association to begin and take some action. Um, and one of the things that we say regularly at our National Institutes of Health and at our CDC is that this, if this had had anything to do with the prostate or erectile dysfunction, probably would have been faster. All right, so we're going to talk now about pitfalls in diagnosis and management, and we'll go through sequentially recognition, diagnosis, and management. And again, we'll revisit concepts that will help us understand how to take care of that case uh, that presented to us. So <clears throat> one of the first things that we did in our women's ischemia syndrome evaluation was that we surveyed the existing literature. Uh, because sometimes when you look, you see things, uh, if you're looking for things, you're more likely to find them that may have been missed before. Um, and so one of the first things that we published in JAMA was this paradox that women have a two-fold increase in, quote, normal coronary arteries in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, non-ST segment elevation, and then ST segment elevation MI. It ranges anywhere from 10 to 30 percent. Said another way, 10% of STEMIs in women have no obstructive coronary disease. 30% of angiograms in women with ACS or non-STEMI have no obstructive coronary disease. They've had a heart attack, a real heart attack. They've met all criteria for having a real life-threatening heart attack, and yet they don't have the disease that we think we know how to recognize and treat. So this was a bit of an eye-opener. These were all registry. These were all core lab studies. This wasn't um, error. This wasn't uh, that we couldn't uh, read angiograms. So taking that, and then the first five years of our women's ischemia syndrome evaluation, sponsored by National Heart, Lung, and Blood, your tax dollars at work, 
designed specifically to answer this question, is this real? How do, how do women, how, how often and, and, and what is the mechanisms of being able to have heart attacks with open arteries? We now have described what we call the uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction. It's depicted in this published case where uh, panel A demonstrates that the woman has a reversible SPECT defect. This is, a, you know, in the old days would have been thallium, now it's technetium. Um, she has uh, no obstructive disease in panel B. Angiogram looks perfectly fine, even though she has a very abnormal SPECT. And then panel C is something you're not used to seeing. <clears throat> even most cardiologists don't do this, although now with FFR, we're seeing these more often, is a Doppler coronary flow reserve. And what we can see is that it's very abnormal. She has an insufficient flow reserve. She cannot dilate her arteries when she goes up a flight of stairs, when she has an angry argument. She also has a high filling pressure, LVEDP. This is like a wedge pressure. Um, and then finally in panel D, she has diffuse atherosclerosis. So despite this normal appearing angiogram, women are better able to kind of what we say, put the garbage away, put the plaque away into the wall. And we don't see it showing up in our luminograms. We've used the NCDR, our big ACC database, to estimate that there are three million women in the US with this problem, microvascular coronary dysfunction. It, it can kill women, it causes heart attacks. This is a larger problem than breast cancer, both numerically and from morbidity and mortality. So what happens then when we use coronary angiograms as our way to define a disease? And this is a pictorial diagram that we put together and published in the European Journal a couple summers ago. So when women look like men, as Barbara Streisand does on the left panel, when their angiograms look like men, when women have obstructive CAD, they get treated. They get recognized and they get treated. When women look like women, and a third of our women have this microvascular pattern in the setting of their ischemic heart disease, as Barbara does here with her husband, Jim, they don't get recognized, much less likely to get recognized. And what we see then is if you don't have something that, that we know how to treat, if the cardiologist doesn't see what they know how to treat, we're less likely to dispense these life-saving medications, and we're gonna talk about them. <clears throat> and so you can see uh, very few women end up in this, in this good zone where they get treated, where over here it's mostly women. It's a third of all cases, it's mostly women. They don't get treated. And this is where we see these excess deaths. So what have we done <clears throat> 20 years now into this project? Well, we've worked hard on guidelines. Uh, and your cardiologist will tell you that these practice guidelines um, help them, help good doctors be great doctors. Uh, because the guidelines are always reminding you. And the guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. They're not telling you exactly what to do. But they're reminding you what best practices will be in these situations. So we've been able to um, <clears throat> have either sex-specific or sex-specific components in these two guidelines that are highlighted in yellow. And these are two guidelines, prevention and then treatment of acute coronary syndrome, that really covers a, a lot of the territory in the setting of ischemic heart disease. What's happened since we've deployed these guidelines? And they are quite nationwide. And again, these are often embedded into your electronic health record, or they are embedded uh, into the different ways that you care for your patients. Um, and so this is publications from an external group. And we're always so excited to see people replicate our work. This is kind of a complicated slide. It is guideline uh, deaths due to cardiovascular disease uh, in the setting of acute coronary syndromes. And it's coded accor according to before and after guidelines and according to male and female. So I've color coded this for you. So following guidelines implementation, these are the female lives that were saved. So this is the before and after for women. These are the male uh, before and after. So we didn't save many male lives using guidelines, but why is that? Because they were pretty much already getting guidelines. They had the disease that we know how to treat, so they were getting guidelines. <clears throat> Here's what's left. If we thought women should do as well as men, 
uh, we still have a persisting gap. So there's knowledge gaps and there's guidelines gaps and we can do better. All right, so number one in summary for recognition, women are less likely to be recognized and it's not because we don't like women, it's, this is not an issue of, of uh, discrimination. We don't voluntarily withhold these medications, it's because we don't recognize the women. So one of the things that we've done at the national level, and I encourage everyone to do this at the local level, call it ischemic heart disease. And you'll see when we write grants now and when we write review articles, it's ischemic heart disease. Because ischemic heart disease kills people. Coronary artery disease is something that you can fix with a, a, a stent or bypass uh, or medications, uh, but it's not what women are gonna most likely have. Okay, let's move on to diagnosis. <clears throat> so what should we do now? How, with this new knowledge that 30% of the women that you're gonna see don't have obstructive CAD, which so much of the cardiology treatment is anchored on, how should we evaluate women? And oh, by the way, about 10% of men will present this way as well. So if we do a better job with women, we're gonna do a better job for that one in 10 men. And, and one in 10 of the leading killer of Americans, that's hundreds of thousands of men too. <clears throat> so um, this is new data. Remember the old Diamond and Forrester categorization of typical and atypical angina. And the question is, does that still work? Um, and it turns out it doesn't look like it works very well. So here's non-anginal chest pain, here's atypical angina, and here's typical angina. Oops, sorry. And the take-home message <clears throat> is that angina classification does not stratify CAD in women. It doesn't do much better in men, but it really doesn't work in women. And so what's the take-home message for here? If you have a woman with symptoms, anything above the waist is what we say. You know, if she's middle-aged or above, if she has risk factors, you should be testing her. It's not okay to ignore atypical symptoms. And it's not okay to say, well, you know, you're a woman and I was taught in medical school that atypical symptoms are not, that's not, not okay anymore. <clears throat> so here's guidelines for how to approach symptomatic women with suspected ischemic heart disease. Um, if they have a high risk, of course, you're gonna go to coronary angiography. Uh, if they have intermediate risk and they uh, are able to exercise, you're gonna do a routine exercise stress test and we're gonna talk about that. If they have an abnormal resting ST segment, again, remember about our case, uh, then you're gonna choose uh, some type of stress imaging first. Um, so, and these are, these are pretty simple and again, these can be embedded into guidelines or if your hospital or your practice uses choose Using wisely, which is uh, our new uh, what's the best test for a lot of different areas of medicine, the choosing wisely follows these guidelines. Um, what do you get out of a stress test, especially if you can do a functional exercise stress testing, which is still our most affordable option and our most routinely available? So what about functional capacity? What's functional capacity? How long can you go on that treadmill on a standardized protocol? Uh, and, and I get patients back and they say, oh, that stress test was really hard. And I said, well, it's called a stress test. We make it hard, that's why. All right, so what about functional capacity, how long you can go? Functional capacity works pretty darn well for women. Um, and we do not pay enough attention to this. Uh, and one of the things to uh, insist on your stress testing laboratory is that they tell you the MET's achieved and it's not hard. It's right there on the, on the protocol. <clears throat> what about some of these older scores? What about the Duke treadmill score? This, was, uh, this is a 25-year-old score. If the Diamond and Forrester categorization for angina doesn't work anymore, what about the Duke treadmill score? Works pretty darn well. Um, and uh, this is something, you know, you, can, you don't even have to have, uh, uh, you know, a worksheet. Just Google Duke treadmill score and it pops right up and you can boom, 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 put in your three parameters in, in literally 10 seconds, you can have somebody risk stratified. Um, so it works well, it works well in women and it works well in men, uh, so, so use it. Uh, should you uh, always do imaging in women? We've been talking about how women are a little more diagnostically challenging. So should you just skip 
to a SPECT or an ECHO or whatever it is that you do in your community. Um, that was a hypothesis tested by the optimal method for ischemia evaluation in women, the women trial. I was an investigator with Dr. Leslie Shaw. Um, and what you see here is really no significant difference. Women were randomized to a regular exercise stress test or a regular exercise stress test with a SPECT radionuclide perfusion imaging, uh, and indeed uh, there was no significant difference. So you do not need to do scanning first. Imaging is not appropriate in intermediate risk women with a normal ECG and those that can exercise. What about the intermediate risk women that have an abnormal ECG, they can't exercise, or you place them in a higher risk category. Uh, and this is, again, guidelines. You can use your best judgment. You can order imaging off the bat. So what about stress echo? Um, is that a reasonable choice? Uh, works equally well in women and men. Uh, and this is for detection of obstructive coronary disease, but that is also true for prognosis. <clears throat> Uh, how about stress perfusion? Again, the SPECT um, that's most routinely available, as is ECHO, um, works equally well in women and men for obstructive CAD and for prognosis. Uh, so uh, these tests are all fine, and you would order the best tests that your uh, local people do. Uh, usually, if they tell you what they do best, uh, that's the best one to order. Now. <clears throat> What should we do with these coronary angiograms? Um, we know the, that it's no longer a yes, no. It used to be yes, they have obstructive coronary disease. No, they don't have obstructive coronary disease. Uh, well, here's new data. Uh, if you have completely normal, uh, you're still at risk if you're a woman over 65, uh, but non-obstructive CAD now needs to be attended to and needs to be in that report. Uh, and you need to ask your cardiologist, no, 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 I don't want to hear that they were normal. I want to hear, did you see evidence of atherosclerosis? Uh, and if they can't do that for you, order a CAC score, which is those calcium scores for, uh, we use them for screening. Um, one vessel, two vessel, three vessel. And what you can see from this newer data is that women are at a higher prognostic risk for any amount of plaque, any amount of plaque. So we have to pay attention to this, and you will get this in your CATH reports if you ask them for it. <clears throat> okay, so we've done recognition. Here's diagnosis. Symptomatic women have an intermediate risk. There, it, it, there's no really low risk symptomatic women, so you gotta pay attention to symptoms. Um, and you need to test symptomatic women for ischemia and for prognosis, and the best way to do that is stress testing, and that can be done affordably. All right, let's talk a little bit about management. Um, women remain the majority of victims of cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> Remember that in 1984, curves crossed, we're still the majority of victims. Uh, and we still receive fewer interventions to prevent and treat heart disease. Here's the laundry list. <clears throat> Women are less likely to get cholesterol screening, less, and that's even in a secondary fashion, meaning the woman and the man both had heart attacks. Uh, this is a HEDIS uh, quality predictor. Uh, which one is most likely to have an LDL in the chart? The man. And why is that? They both had heart attacks. We think it's because the, the physician didn't think it was a real heart attack. So we're dispelling this myth. Fewer lipid-lowering therapies, therefore, are dispensed. <clears throat> Less use of heparin, beta blockers, and aspirin during myocardial infarction. Less antiplatelet therapy for secondary prevention. Fewer referrals to cardiac rehab. Fewer implantable defibrillators and heart transplants compared to men with the same recognized conditions. Um, so this is, this is a problem. All right, so how do we get results? Number one, and we talked about this briefly before, we are name, renaming it ischemic heart disease. And this gets away from the umbrella of coronary artery disease, which is synonymous in most treating physicians with obstructive CAD. And we now know that you can die with non-obstructive CAD. <clears throat> a simplified approach to ischemic heart disease management helps increase adherence to guidelines. Um, this can be achieved using an ABC format to present important pharmacologic therapies as well as lifestyle approaches. So here's the ABCs. You know these. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are the four life-saving pills that if you have had an ACS, ACS, non-STEMI, STEMI, 
<clears throat> if you are on these four pills a year later, you have a well over 90% chance of being alive a year later. So uh, they are low-dose aspirin. If they got stents, they might be on additional antiplatelet agents. Uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors for those intolerant ARBs, beta blockers, and cholesterol management, which is, is dominantly statins. Those are the four magic pills. <clears throat> if you are on it, 90% reduction in recurrent major adverse cardiac events. All right, now what about, you know, we've talked a lot about gender differences. What about these pills? Do they work in women? And if so, do they work equally well in women and men? And it turns out they do. So for these life-saving categories, these work. And the good news is we have plenty of data because plenty of women have had heart attacks. So unlike some of the cholesterol controversy for primary prevention, and it is controversial, uh, secondary prevention, which is treatment of heart attacks, uh, this is all uh, known to work equally well in women and men. All right, what about these women and men with this female pattern? What about they have no obstructive CAD, but it looks like they had an ACS. Uh, so remember, ischemic heart disease, ACS, acute coronary syndrome, and angina guidelines, they are not cath-based. They don't say, you have a patient with an ACS, first do a cath and then decide how to treat them. None of the guidelines say that. They say you can do a cath if, it, if they seem to be high risk, but they say if you have diagnosed an ACS, here are the treatment. Get started because time is of the essence. Number two, abundant evidence exists documenting the life-saving risk reduction of these four magic pills. Um, and again, there are low-dose aspirin, ACE or an ARB, a beta blocker, and a statin. Uh, and patients that get started on these medications in the hospital for their ACS are more likely to be taking them a year later. Compliance is higher. And the power of your prescription pen to implement these guidelines therapies preferentially will save women's lives. That's what we see in the, guide, in the registries following the guidelines. So you can save a lot of lives uh, by following guidelines. I do want to mention some of the research. Um, this is more cutting edge, not quite ready for prime time. This is a cardiac MRI, um, which we do now uh, frequently in our center of excellence. Uh, and what this demonstrates is a woman with microvascular coronary dysfunction, right ventricle, left ventricle. Um, here's the blood pool, gadolinium coming through. This black in her myocardium is her microvascular dysfunction. It is more subendocardial than full-on epicardial. Uh, it is, it, you will not see this on an echo. You will not see this on a spec. So uh, not infrequently, the other forms, the traditional forms of imaging will miss this. Uh, and we're very excited about the ability. Seeing is believing in cardiology. Um, cardiologists will, will act on something that they can see, often with imaging. Uh, so we're very excited about this uh, new modality. Uh, and, and again, we're using it for clinical care, and uh, uh, I would anticipate that it will be out in community care, uh, but probably not in the next two years. Um, here is an example of how we're using this in the research. Uh, this is a case example that we published in JAK Imaging uh, for uh, a, a randomized controlled trial of a novel antianginal renalazine. At the time it was novel, right now, now it's out in practice. Um, and this basically gives you the scans. These are cross-sectional uh, mid-ventricular slices. This is a quantitative estimate. Uh, a myocardial perfusion reserve of 1.2 is very abnormal. 2.5 is very normal. It's pinking up or it's getting brighter. You can no longer see this subendocardial rim. And when we unblinded, this was renalazine and this was placebo. Uh, and this was the same patient. So we are always, always interested um, in your referrals for these research, uh, and this would be someone with persistent chest pain that wanted to volunteer for research. Um, there's nothing inherently dangerous about this. Um, we typically use uh, uh, FDA-approved drugs because we're interested in studying coronary microvascular dysfunction, not a new drug. Um, and I put my email there should you want to send any of your patients that have persistent chest pain. We're also testing um, in this particular protocol and a future protocol that we're starting this summer. 
the links between coronary microvascular dysfunction and what we now call HEFPEF, which stands for uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this is also predominantly a woman's problem. We have an epidemic of, of hospitalizations, often recurrent now for heart failure, and yet their ejection fraction is normal, 65, 70, 75 percent. And we have, we have no good treatments. Uh, and again, mostly because we haven't studied it and we don't understand the mechanistic pathways. Okay, so in summary, where, where were we and where are we? So these were the lines that we talked about. Uh, the curves crossed in 84. Uh, Bernadine Healy wrote her op-ed. Um, things were getting pretty desperate. Uh, and then the National Heart, Lung, and Blood and AHA uh, started their activities. So um, here's what's happened in the last uh, decade. And it's pretty exciting. Uh, we have seen a 43% decline. The, the, the curve finally bent. <laughs> And um, these are observational data. This is true, possibly true. We don't say that it's related, but we'd like to think that these guidelines and these activities that we've been pursuing uh, have made a difference. So uh, in the terms of management, uh, our strong recommendation is to treat ischemic heart disease uh, and that can be presented in the form of an acute coronary syndrome to the cardiologist or stable ischemic heart disease, which is angina in your office, in women with guidelines therapy uh, to improve outcomes. All right, we're going to spin through these, uh, this case one more time. So recall, it was a gal in her 40s. She came in, she had an abnormal EKG, she had a positive troponin, but she had no obstructive CAD by a CT angiogram. Um, so, what was that diagnosis? How many now believe it was non-cardiac? How many thought, think it was pericarditis? And how many think it was ischemic heart disease status post? Yep, you got it. You guys are good learners. <clears throat> All right, should she have any further evaluation? Who thinks that she's fine? Remember, she was on baby aspirin, a low dose Prevacol of a less potent statin, and then a verapamil. Uh, okay, how many think she should have exercise stress ECG testing? Remember, her, her ECG was abnormal in your office. Okay, and how many think she should have stress testing with imaging? So she would meet the imaging guidelines, and you're choosing wisely this thing now that's helping us order would uh, concur with you. They would uh, say, yes, she should have imaging. All right, how many uh, think that current treatment is fine? Good. How many think that she should be started on indocin and steroids for pericarditis? Good. And then who thinks that we should replace that calcium channel with a beta blocker? If she still has angina, how about adding an ACE or an ARB? Take her off the verapamil, because she probably needs antihypertensive therapy. She was, she was hypertensive with her kids. And intensify her statin therapy. Yeah. And that's guidelines, right? The new cholesterol management guidelines say if you have established ASCVD, you should be on a potent statin. Uh, Go-to drugs would be a torvastatin generic or rosuvastatin as your best class in someone who has documented atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease. Okay, so these are the low-dose magic pills. All right, thank you so much. I don't know if I have time. Uh, Tom, do, I, do you want Q&A? Okay, very good. So it's open for questions. There's one in the back. Women have more Raynaud's phenomenon than men, and lupus patients have more Raynaud's phenomenon. Yes, so this is a great question, just to repeat it in case anyone couldn't hear. Uh, did she have Raynaud's? and lupus patients often do, and calcium channel blockers are one of the you know, best treatments for Raynaud's. Um, she did not, there is not a clear link between Raynaud's or migraine headaches and what we've been describing in terms of coronary microvascular dysfunction. Um, that said, if you have a patient that has Raynaud's, particularly um, the, the severe Raynaud's, the scleroderma kind of Raynaud's, and they can have a digital necrosis, uh, you would be very hesitant to do that. Um, but with our lupus patients, we have not found that to be a problem. We work closely. We have a very big lupus clinic um, with Dr. Daniel Wallace in Los Angeles. Um, and we've not found this to be a problem for the vast majority of patients, meaning swapping out their CCB for their 
for um, a beta blocker, and then our go-to beta blocker is better tolerated, which is carvedilol. It is an alpha beta blocker, uh, typically better tolerated in women as well as men, uh, particularly if you use the low-dose heart failure protocol to titrate them up. So 3.125, this is easy and generic, BID, and then you can step up, step up, step up, all the way up to 25 sometimes. Most women don't need that high of a dose. Um, last but not least about CCBs, cardiovascular disease and, and microvascular, in general, women do better on an alpha beta blocker than they do on a calcium channel blocker. That's been tested in randomized controlled trials, and yet we always reach for those CCBs first. So give these beta blockers a shot uh, if, you, if the patient really does have ischemic heart disease. If they don't tolerate the beta blocker or they're not able to take it because of COPD, because of bradycardia, you know, the contraindications to beta blockade, fine re reach for the calcium channel blocker. So red rice yeast is a um, over-the-counter supplement um, that is uh, imported dominantly, uh, it's a Chinese import, and it is irregularly um, pulled from the market by uh, regulators because it is lovastatin. If it is red rice yeast, and you probably all read the New York Times article about six weeks ago where they did DNA tracers for 100 over-the-counter supplements in the U.S., and essentially none of them had any of what the labels said that they were supposed to have by DNA testing. So if your patient actually got some real red rice yeast, <laughs> and you would probably know that by LDL levels, um, you know, should they use, and so most of them are not effective, and of course these are, um, Compared to generics, actually much more expensive. The per pill cost is typically over the counter much more expensive. And then the last reason my counsel is to take an FDA approved drug is that it is monitored for safety. Uh, and these over the counter supplements are not. And we do get periodic, you know, Herbal Life was fined, I think, $100 million for contaminants in their over-the-counter supplements, some of their, you know, diet drugs. Is there a difference in um, angina patterns with microvascular disease, like um, triggers or what it looks like? Yeah, it's a great question. So we did that early on in WISE. We had this idea, that's a great idea, that we could build a better mouse trap, that we could come up with a female angina. Um, and we, we did a lot, we worked with psychometricians and we asked a lot of questions of those first 1,000 women. And um, it, it's, uh, we did come up with a score that was 7% uh, better and it was statistically significant. But if you were sitting in a clinic trying to decide what to do with someone for 7% improvement, you know, would, would you? And it wasn't, it wasn't definitive either, you know, it was. So um, we were unable to, and, and I believe, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's because cardiac angina is due to two things. One is disturbance of blood flow. And we now recognize that you can have blood flow disturbance resulting in ischemia from a variety of conditions. You can have ischemia just from an elevated filling pressure if you have microvasculature that don't dilate. So it doesn't have to be exertional. It, it can be symptoms that come and go. We know now that patients can have chest pain for hours without infarcting, and it is ischemia. It's just not bad enough to cause an infarct. So the old rules that, you know, if it lasted more than 30 minutes and the troponin's negative means it's not ischemia, that's also not true. So, so that's one cause. And then the second cause, and we've had a, um, a pain research project, our pain receptors uh, use adenosin. Our cardiac pain receptors use adenosin as the molecular target and trigger. And, and a lot of things cause pain. Um, these are patients that your invasive cardiologist will tell you, you put the catheter into the coronary sinus and they go, up, 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 up. I feel that, I feel that, I feel that. And, and that's adenosin. 
So uh, patients that go in and have their stress um, studies that they can't exercise, we use adenosine or dipyridamol, and they say, ouch, 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 oh, that's chest pain. So there are pain receptors, and we call this a cardiac nociceptive abnormality, and there's a lot of crosstalk, there's a lot of overlap between these blood flow abnormalities and these pain receptor abnormalities. Needless to say, if you can document that it's just a pain problem, which we do with these MR scans and we do invasive testing, then we reassure them and we send them to the pain doctors because it's a pain problem. It's not actually ischemia. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Got to pay attention to anything above the waist. That's the bottom line, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, and that is possibly true or possibly a reporting bias. So here's why it could be possibly true. We were a site for the um, PIMI, which was a multi-site psychological triggers of ischemia. It was in the 1980s when we were very interested in mental stress and mental stress triggered ischemia. Um, and so as PIMI investigators, uh, we commissioned a, a sex difference study. We sex stratified the data. And it was very, very clear that women have a higher somatic awareness than men. What does that mean? Women are better at feeling their bodies and telling people that, about what they feel. Uh, and you'll see this, this is a good primary care statistic as well. If you, if you stratify your review of systems by uh, gender, uh, women check a lot more boxes, right? Isn't that true? Okay. So, so it could be, and this appears to be biologically hardwired, meaning women that have higher estrogen levels, premenopausal women have higher somatic awareness than postmenopausal women who have lower estrogen levels. So the, the anthropologists think that this is probably something that is uh, biological and probably related to the, all the things, you know, women uniquely childbear. So women need to know when they're pregnant, they need to know when they're in labor, they need to know to stay in the cave. I mean, who knows why, but it appears to be biologically hardwired that women on average have a higher somatic awareness. It could be due to gender bias, meaning um, there is still a fair amount of sexism in our society and, and, <laughs> and it, well, what we choose to recognize, what we choose to recognize, and we are all uh, victims or the beneficiaries of the society that we live in, and the gender-covered glasses that we live in. I mean, something that you've read about regularly, you know, um, Mark and Sarah are both undergraduates. They both graduate. They both have honors. They both go into that first job. And Mark is more likely to be hired, and he's more likely to be hired at five or 10 or 15 or 20,000 more than her. And if you flip the names, you know, uh, it goes the opposite way. So it really has nothing to do with them. It's just, it has to do with their gender. So physicians are more likely to ascribe symptoms in women to something supratentorial. And we think that that's residual sexism in our society that rolls out into medicine. Alan? Annie. On the, normal, on the patient that has normal, normal tensive and normal lipid profile, what should be the target on dosing for those ARBs and ACEs and statins? Okay, so this is a patient that has a po is post-ACS, correct? Good, so she meets all guidelines, but is normotensive and has, quote, a normal lipid panel. Okay, good. So, so one of the things that came out loud and clear in these new cholesterol guidelines from November of 2013 is that the, the lipid panel in an ACS situation, acute coronary syndrome and STEMI, STEMI, uh, doesn't matter. You can measure it just so you can tell how much it drops when you start the statin, but uh, people with entry total cholesterols of 160 should still be treated, and we saw that in all those big randomized controlled trials. 
So the only reason you, or, you order LDLs now in these established ASCVD patients is number one, to show that when you start the statin, you get a 30, at least a 30% drop, ideally 50% drop with these potent statins. And then you measure it twice a year for compliance. They come in and see you and they show you that they're taking it because you're measuring it. For the blood pressure, you are very correct. In a normotensive patient, it is hard to get them on a beta blocker and an ACE ARB. And then that's your you know, challenge. And if they have angina, we typically start with the beta blocker, carvedilol, and we do with the heart failure protocol so they don't, they're not taking too much. And then we see if we can add on the ACE or the ARB, and if we can't, we leave them on the beta blocker. Yeah. What would you recommend for the invasive cardiologist in terms of the workup? So we now um, routinely do coronary reactivity testing, and we've brought back spasm testing. So patients that have a legitimate reason to be in the cath lab, so ACS and STEMI, STEMI, or they've had, you know, they're your frequent flyers in the emergency room, right? More than two admissions in a year to the emergency room for rule out, and they have open arteries, and nobody knows what to do with them. They're not being treated. They're being given sedative hypnotics. They're being, you know, told that they should see a psychiatrist. We will do it in those patients as well, invasive coronary reactivity testing. And what is it? It's a coronary flow reserve with a wire and a denison. Translate that to an interventional cardiologist. It's an FFR. It's just you don't have an obstructive plaque. And then we take it one step further. We do this now as clinical care. We do the uh, acetylcholine graded infusions. That is more complicated. You have to have a pharmacist mix it. The cath lab nurse cannot mix it. It's a graded infusion. Um, what we started two years ago is we brought back the hand injection of the high-dose acetylcholine uh, for spasm testing. And you'll remember back in the day, uh, we used to do ergotamine spasm testing, and we stopped because of a few deaths, right? Refractory spasm and death, and you know, that is always bad. So we're not bringing back ergotamine, but this uh, hand injection of either uh, 100, 200, or if you're really brave, like the Germans and the Japanese, 300, <laughs> over two minutes. And you'll see if they spasm, and you'll see if they have endothelial dysfunction in their epicardial coronaries, and you don't have to put a wire in. And we'd be happy to send you that protocol. Uh, we, have, we published our uh, coronary reactivity uh, testing safety in the WISE site. So these are experienced uh, interventional cardiologists. This isn't just anybody in the middle of the night doing it all by themselves. Um, excellent safety, and that was published in Jack Interventions probably about th two or three years ago. One more question from the audience, and then I have a question. For okay. Hi. Um, I'm a family doc. I have a 91-year-old woman who's uh, non-frail. She's a healthy 91-year-old woman with diabetes, uh, well-controlled, cholesterol well-controlled on statin, and her blood pressure systolic is not uh, in a good range for her. Eight. Well, she's 190 over... Oh 70, my. <laughs> and she is on an ACE and she is on a beta blocker. And I'm nervous about increasing her blood pressure medication because sure. of symptoms that she might get if she gets uh, too uh, overcorrected. Thank you. So she's a good case for our new, uh, our new blood pressure guidelines, which are very controversial. And there, it was a splinter group. I mean, it, the. Uh, the cholesterol guidelines are moderately controversial, but there was very cons good consensus in the committee. The controversy is other people that are completely wrong. Um, but these, <laughs> these blood pressure, the group splintered, and they published two different documents, and NHLBI just threw up their hands and said, these guys are crazy, and gals. Um, so. The, but the guidelines say that um, our older folks don't benefit as much from intensive blood pressure management as our younger under the age of 65. So they've backed off to 150 systolic. And here's what I would say about her. 190 is way too high, even for a 91-year-old. So that's, you're recognizing that and, and understanding that. 
The old folk don't do as well with the beta blockers, and they do better with low-dose diuretics, so chlorthalidone 25 or 50, um, and I would probably work uh, you know, with one of your cardiologists to find something that kind of works for her, and um, she might, you know, I sometimes with my really elderly, I go back to some of the old fashioned, you know, the Aldamed and the Clonidine. If they tolerate it, they do quite well, these centrally acting agents, because she just has really stiff pipes. She's 91, yeah. But a little diuretic is always important for unmanaged old hypertension. There's one more burning question in the back okay. here. Go ahead, and then I have some. Sorry, I, I really wanted to ask, because it's an important question, about follow up on the beta blockers yeah. in coronary artery disease. Um, a, about a year ago, I came across an article that sort of looked at beta blockers in coronary artery disease, and they sort of said, you know, think about them. The, the mortality benefit seems to wane over time, and yeah. think of them as therapy for ACS rather than stable coronary artery disease. Yep. Do you think that this is a practice-changing study, and should we be... So, so you're, a good, you're a good reader, and um, this was a large meta-analyses of uh, you know, existing data, and it did demonstrate that for stable, uh, stable conditions, all the reasons that you would use beta blockers, the patients on the beta blockers did worse than the patients not on the beta blockers. What's the problem with that kind of observational data? <laughs> Who do I put on a beta blocker? You know, somebody with angina. Uh, or somebody with atrial fibrillation and they need some rate control, or somebody, I mean, you know, the, li the laundry list of what uh, a patient will be on a beta blocker for chooses a higher morbidity patient. So um, I don't think that everyone should be on beta blockers. I'm not saying walk out of here and if you sniff any risk in any patient, they should be on a beta blocker, no. But I'm saying if you have a symptomatic patient with angina or an ACS, beta blockers remain a cornerstone of therapy, yeah. Okay, I have two uh, questions. Um, one is uh, being an interventional cardiologist and slugging it out in the middle of the night uh, with women coming in who end up having no obstructive coronary disease, who we've labeled Takutsabu syndrome. Yes, good question. Uh, is this the uh, type of a dynamic coronary problem that you're discussing, and how, what, what, you, what are your comments about that, and why uh, is there such a great uh, discrepancy in the ratio of women to men with that? And the second question is, how do you use the coronary, CT coronary calcium score? Okay, good. So Takutsubos, we, we are working to see if there's a unifying hypothesis, kind of like uh, you know Einstein and uh, the black hole guy, Stephen Hawking. Um, so does microvascular dysfunction explain angina at rest, angina on stress tests, and signs and symptoms of ischemia and acute coronary syndromes that we now, because we take them up to the cath lab, I mean, they've always been there, we just never saw them. We weren't, we didn't have the bedside echo to see the apical ballooning, and we didn't have so many cases that we squirt the coronaries and they're all open. So why are their troponins positive and why do they have apical ballooning? So this has always been underneath our nose, we believe, but we are still collecting data to say that this is the tip of the iceberg of microvascular dysfunction. We have demonstrated with Amir Lerman at Mayo that these Takasubo women, and they are mostly women, have persistent endothelial dysfunction uh, as bad as a CAD patient. And their prognosis is better, but it is not as good as a non takasubos patient. Guidelines right now is to treat them as an ACS, and we don't have randomized controlled trials specific to them. Why so many women? Again, two thoughts. It could be that the men die in the field, and that's true for other, other cardiovascular horrible situations. Conversely, it might be for the reasons that we were talking about why, you know, do women have more psychologically triggered problems? Possibly true for the reasons of, of biologic sex as well as gender. What was your second? Coronary oh, coronary calcium. calcium. So the coronary calcium got um, a 2A recommendation in the new guidelines that you can, cons it is reasonable to consider using this for screening, not for diagnostics, 
but I, I told you about a diagnostic, so that's off-label, but I'll go back there. It is reasonable to consider for screening in patients that you're, they're intermediate risk and you're not sure if you should dispense your low-dose aspirin and your statin. Uh, I order about one a month. I'm, I'm a big uh, believer in statin. I think if, you're, if you meet guidelines or if you're close to meeting guidelines, we'll wait a year. Uh, so I just dispense the statin. But for people that want to be convinced, uh, and then I did talk about an off-label use. Um, we will have women come in for second opinions. They have evident signs and symptoms of ischemia, you know, persistent angina, abnormal stress tests. They already had an angiogram at an outside hospital. And I say, well, do we really need to do an angiogram to show that you really have residual problems that need treatment? This is particularly true, I think, for my premenopausal women, especially if they're still childbearing. Should they be on a statin? Should I tell them that they should take all these pills? So I will sometimes order a CAC score to see if they actually have atherosclerotic plaque. Do they fit into our WISE portfolio? All of those women had plaque. Um, so. Now there's one last question. I understand Jim Trapnell has a burning question. I got a message, so <laughs> Jim. Uh, I don't know if it's burning, but um, that was earlier today. Uh, you didn't talk about, uh, and, and it's not necessarily the topic of your conversation, but the, uh, preventative strategies and how to recognize new risk factors for women since obviously they must have they must they must have other risk factors that we're missing yes to come in and then have higher mortality down the road correct so should we be thinking about uh, autoimmune diseases for instance mm -hmm. since we know that rheumatoid has higher risk or or other this is a great question. So if you look at the 2012 prevention of ASCVD in women guidelines, they say that uh, emerging risk factors that you can use your clinical judgment to increase or lower their risk, particularly for intermediate risk patients. So this is, you're not sure, right, whether or not you should put them on the aspirin and the statin. Autoimmune disease is, is one of those. Adverse pregnancy outcomes, APOs, that's the other new one. So did she have a history of gestational hypertension, as ours did? Did she have a history of gestational diabetes? Did she have a history of preeclampsia or full-on eclampsia? Those are the currently the adverse pregnancy outcomes that can help you decide. And then the other two are um, things that you would order emerging risk factors. And again, these are not class one recommendations. These are 2A and 2B. You can consider it, it might be helpful, that's 2A. You can consider it, might not be helpful, that's 2B. Uh, HSCRP, drawn when they have not had a cold in the last two weeks. Um, and uh, you know, you need to make sure you're looking, that you know what your lab is reporting to you. I get all these patients, you know, there's a milligram per deciliter report and there's a milligram per liter report. Uh, and you need to, you know, be clear about the Jupiter trial was greater than 2.0 milligrams per liter and that's the cutoff. So don't get crazy about these high sensitivity CRPs that are low. And then the second one is a CAC score, a coronary artery calcium score. Um, and above 300 is where it counts as an additional risk factor. So these little scores of five and seven and 10, I'm not saying it's good, they have a little plaque, but it is not prognostically useful in the 10-year risk for that. Does that help? All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. That was a fantastic, fantastic discussion and talk. Thank you.